Greetings, students. Uh, so today we are going to talk about gene pools. So to understand what a gene pool is, first you need to remember what an allele is. So an allele is a version of a gene. Um, and so what we mean by that is something like here in this example, uh, we're going to talk about frogs have two different skin colors. Um, if they have the dominant allele, they'll be spotted. So this would be dominant. And this should all look familiar. Um, we write the dominant allele by convention with a capital letter. And then in this case, if they have uh, two recessive alleles, they'll have no spots. So we would say recessive. So this is a regular complete dominance gene. Uh, so there are three different possible genotypes and two different phenotypes. Um, so we could have a frog that is homozygous dominant. Remember homo means same. So that means they have two of the same letter, and in this case, it's the dominant letter, so they would be big A, big A. A, fr a frog could be heterozygous, so that would be hetero, meaning different. So in this case, they have one big A and one little a. And then we could be homozygous recessive, so little a, little a. And I hope you can recognize that these two genotypes are gonna give one phenotype. This is gonna give the dominant phenotype. Whereas there's only one single genotype, little a, little a, or homozygous recessive, that will give us that recessive phenotype. Okay, so that's just a quick reminder of what an allele is. So allele is just telling us it's that big A or little a, it's the dominant version of the gene or the recessive version of a gene. Okay, so to understand the version of, or the concept of gene pools, let's imagine that we have five frogs um, these are our frogs, so we have two that are homozygous dominant, two that are heterozygous, and one that's homozygous recessive. And let's say it's mating season for these frogs, so they all meet up around a pool and release their gametes into a pool. Um, so remember that a gamete only has one allele. So I should say it only carries one version of each allele. Uh, or I should say one allele for each gene. So when we talk about a genotype, uh, like for example with the yellow frog, he was little a, little a, that's the genotype. There's two alleles there because that frog got one from both of its parents. But when that frog is making gametes during meiosis, the gametes that it makes are only going to have one allele for each gene. So that's why when all these frogs get together and they release their alleles into this pool, the alleles just kind of all get mixed up and it doesn't matter like which frog they came from. So it's sort of like we just have all of these alleles all together in one big place. Uh, so this gives us this idea of a gene pool. And what we mean by gene pool is it's just all of the possible alleles in that population. So a gene pool is all of the genes and alleles in a population. In our example, we're just talking about skin color for these frogs, but of course they have many, many other genes and their gene pool would be all of the different types of alleles for all of the different genes. Um, <laughs> this picture on the left makes it like a very literal pool. Obviously this is just sort of a very simple example, but in reality the gametes aren't always all in a pool. Like for example, here are some pictures of mice. So in these mice there's many different genes. So we can see there's a gene for uh, like big T, little t that's telling us something about like coat color, and then we've got one for C, and we've got one for S. So there's three different genes. And then each gene has different versions of it, so different alleles. And the gene pool would be if we took all of those letters in that picture and just put them together in a big pile, that would be a gene pool. Okay, so the reason that gene pools are important is because we need to start thinking about not just the genes that a single individual has, so not the genes in like this one individual mouse, but the genes of all the mice together as a population. Because now in this unit, in the evolution unit, instead of thinking about the genes and the alleles of a single individual, we need to start thinking about the alleles of the entire population and how that changes over time. So it becomes a much like bigger picture idea. And that's why we need to start thinking about gene pools. So the way that's gonna translate into what you need to understand is being able to calculate frequencies of these different genes. And a frequency is just a fraction. So it's going to be a fraction. And it's always going to be a fraction that's less than one. So it's sort of like a percent 
but we're expressing that percent as a decimal. So this is asking, what is the allele frequency of the dominant A allele? So to do this, first we have to just count the total number of alleles. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we have ten total alleles. And then we'd need to count how many of those alleles are dominant, so just the big A's. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Six out of 10. And then of course you'd wanna simplify that. So our answer would be 0 0.6. Okay, let's do another one. What is the frequency of the recessive allele? So in this case, we could do the same thing. Um, we could count the total number of alleles and then do the just recessive over the total. Um, or you could also have realized that we just in the previous problem figured out that the dominant allele was 0.6, therefore the recessive allele must be 0.4 because that's all that's left. So in this case, it's gonna be 0.4. Okay, so now there's a space in the Google Doc for this module. Go ahead and stop and jot thing for a second. See if you can answer this question. So frogs without spots are more likely to be eaten than frogs with spots. Based on this, what do you think will happen to the frequency of the dominant allele over many generations? So go ahead and pause the video and take a moment to answer that question. Okay, so frogs that don't have spots are more likely to get eaten. So in other words, the little a allele, if a frog is homozygous recessive for that allele, they're more likely to get eaten. In that case, we would say spots are a beneficial adaptation because the spots are helping that individual survive and reproduce. Frogs with spots are more likely to survive and pass on their genes. And over many generations, the frequency of the spots, so the big A allele, is going to increase in the gene pool. So in other words, the frequency of those alleles is gonna be changing over time, and that's what happens in evolution. So that's exactly what this picture is showing us. So in the initial generation, um, you can see that we had a pretty even mix of the dominant and recessive allele. And over many generations, you can see, um, in this case, the home or the recessive allele is advantageous. But over many generations, essentially, that disadvantageous dominant allele is going away. And so this change over time, this is evolution. So we can now redefine evolution in terms of allele frequencies. Um, so we can say evolution is a change in the allele frequencies in a population over many generations. Okay, so that's what we mean when we say evolution is change over time. Um, we can specifically mean it's the change in allele frequencies over time. Okay, so let's do a little bit more practice with calculating these frequencies. Uh, so what are the frequencies of the dominant and recessive alleles in this example? Um, so first off, we need to count all of the alleles. Well, if we count, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine flowers. So there's nine flowers. And we can recognize that each flower has two alleles. So that means we're gonna have 18 total alleles. Okay, so for dominant, we can go through and just count the big W. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So big W dominant is gonna be 13 over 18. And then that means little w, the recessive, is going to be 5 over 18. And there are frequencies. We should simplify that um, so we can report it as a decimal. I just don't have a calculator on me right now. <laughs> okay, let's do another one. What are the frequencies of the dominant and recessive alleles? So same thing, we'll start just by counting the number of individuals. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we've got 10 rabbits and each rabbit has two alleles so that means we have 20 total alleles and then for the dominant we'll just count um, the big A's in this case there's a lot more well no it'll be okay so we've got uh, one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so big A is going to be 10 over 20 which will be 0.5. And then little a, same thing, we can count them, but we could also realize that big A plus little a has to be one. So little a must just be 0.5. Okay, let's do one more. What are the frequencies of the dominant and recessive alleles in this example? 
60 flowering plants are planted in a flower bed, 40 plants are homozygous dominant, and 20 plants are homozygous recessive. Um, so first off, we've got 60 plants times two alleles total per plant, which means we're gonna have 120 alleles total. Okay, so for the dominant, which I'm just gonna say is big A, uh, so we've got 40 plants here. So for big A, it's gonna be 40 plants with two alleles per plant times two, so 80 big A alleles. So the frequency of A is just gonna be 80 divided by 120, which is two thirds, so that's 0.67. And then for little a, we can count, so uh, 20 plants times two allele per plant is gonna be 40 alleles for little a. And so that frequency is gonna be 40 divided by 120, which is one third. Or of course we could have recognized that if the dominant allele is two thirds, then of course the recessive allele must be one third. So that's just gonna be 0 0.33. Okay, and there we go. That's how we calculate allele frequencies. Now go ahead and take a couple minutes to, in your Google Doc, um, in the module, do some of these practice problems to make sure that you really understand how to calculate these frequencies because this is the first step in calculating Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and this is a really important first step that you definitely need to understand before you dive into those problems. Best of luck!